is you take a ball or a cylinder. And I don't know if you guys have heard this before or not, but you know, if you spin a ball fast enough, it'll develop lift. Have, has anybody heard that before? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it'll affect the airflow around it. That's how pitchers can throw curve balls, and that's how people can make, you know, do tricks with like balls when they throw them because um, they're spinning them. And when they get the spin, it affects the airflow, it creates lift, and then that's how you get the uh, trajectory change on it. Now, this is something you have to kind of visualize. So this is a cylinder basically at a standstill, and then this is a cylinder being rotated. Okay? Now there's two dynamics I want you to look at. One is airflow, and then the other one is pressure. Okay. So basically airflow, you take an airflow, like let's say we put the cylinder in like wind tunnel or something like that. You take your airflow, it hits it. It's going to hit it, it's going to go over, and it's going to go around. Okay, it's going to hit it, it's going to go over, it's going to go around. Okay? Now, this red is going to stand for pressure. Okay, now pressure is a pressure differential over a surface. It's not something you can see, but you've got to be able to visualize it all the same. Now, when you take the pressure, there's two types of pressure. There's a static pressure, and then there's a dynamic pressure around it. So the static pressure, basically, you can think of it as negative pressure, or, you know, the minus sign. Okay, so that's static, and then there's dynamic pressure, which you can think of the positive sign. Okay, so the pressure differential, the pressure over the surface or static pressure when the airflow hits it can kind of be visualized like this. And you'll remember this drawing that I made yesterday. Now, you remember us talking about the Bernoulli's principle, right? And what exactly was Bernoulli's principle that we had talked about? Okay, remember this, where we made this drawing right here, where you basically have a tube. Oh, don't worry. Right, okay. Okay. right exactly. Pressure. Okay? So then you take fluid, put it through a constriction, like that, and then what are you going to have? You're going to have basically velocity and then pressure. Velocity, pressure, and then velocity, pressure, okay? And what you're going to find is that at this point right here, your velocity and your pressure is going to be equal to each other in relation to whatever it is. So for mo so much velocity that you have, you're going to have so much pressure. In this constriction, your velocity is going to speed up. You have an increase in velocity, you're going to have a corresponding drop in pressure until you reach the other end of constriction. And then you're going to have a corresponding equal velocity, equal pressure. Okay. Now all this happens right here is this is the difference between your kinetic energy and your potential energy. So there's an energy transfer going on. As we all know, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So, so for what it has to gain in velocity, it takes away from its pressure. Okay. Now, that being said, you go back to the Magnus effect, the sphere example. Okay. The blue is your fluid passing over the sphere. Your red is your static pressure, or what this indicates is your decrease in pressure. Okay. So, as it hits the sphere you're going to have a corresponding increase due to the curvature of the sphere, so your fluid is going to speed up. At the same time, where the fluid speeds up, you're going to have a corresponding drop in pressure. And then this red right here indicates negative or basically static pressure. Okay? Static or negative in relation to what? Well, the pressure around it. So you got a bunch of negatives here. Negative, 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 negative. Right there. And then you have, okay, so everybody kind of picturing that so far? Yeah. All right, good deal. So this is basically what I want you all to draw, and this is kind of what I want you all to hammer in your head. Now, the Magnus effect basically, now let's say we put the cylinder in motion. So you have this fluid right here. It hits the sphere, or the cylinder, and it increases the speed. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not talking about in terms of speed here, but it's in the cylinder. What's going to happen is the location of your static pressure is going to change. 
okay? And then kind of like the drawing from yesterday, you'll have something like this. But then you'll have a corresponding increase in your static pressure in relation to where the cylinder is turning. And then you'll have so much corresponding static pressure like that. So you're going to see a decrease on the bottom, decrease in your static pressure on the bottom with an increase in your static pressure on top. So it's going to look something like this. with a bunch of pluses around it. So, what does this mean to anybody? I guess that uh, when it's kind of, when it's just not moving, it's balanced, or it's kind of like evenly distributed? Right, exactly, so it's evenly distributed. So it's evenly distributed, and then when it's <coughs> basically you have a spin to it, what happens is you have more <coughs> static pressure on top of your cylinder than you have at the bottom. So therefore, that's the basis on how lift is generated. Now, as far as spinning the cylinder is concerned, I, they, they, they spin the cylinder to basically um, simulate, I guess, or represent the camber on top of an air, uh, airfoil. But that is essentially your Magnus effect right there. Okay. Now, in relation to your airfoil, and I'll go ahead and erase this one. Everybody got this one down? Yep. Okay. Now, in relation to your airfoil, right here, now in relation to your airfoil, right here, When you have your relative wind hit the airfoil, you'll have a corresponding increase in speed in relation to where it hits it. Well, you're going to have a rise in static pressure pretty similar to what you'll see on a Magnus effect on your cylinder. So you're going to have a point of stagnant, uh, static pressure right here a corresponding increase in static pressure up here and it'll look like that. Actually it'll look more like and then you'll have static pressure right there and then you'll have static pressure right there. Actually it won't be that big. You'll get something like that more on a symmetrical airfoil than anything else. So you have static pressure like that. Okay, so then what you got, I'm sorry, what you have is then you'll have negative pressure. You'll have an area of negative pressure over an area of dynamic pressure or positive pressure right here. Therefore, your resultant is that you have your lift. Now, just a word of note. These points right here, right there, right there, right there, right there, they do apply. They're known as stagnation points, basically. And that's points where the airflow comes to a stop or hence no lift is generated. More on that later. Okay. But that's, the essential, that's essentially the Magnus effect and how it correlates. Let's go ahead lift. and talk about the boundary lift. Now you take your airfoil. Okay, now for purposes of telling you, I'm going to go ahead and just top the, draw the top part of the airfoil right here, okay? So imagine that's your top part right there, okay? Now when we talk about the boundary layer, what we're talking about is we're talking about an area, of basically a pocket of air, if you will. It would be better if I just drew it. So you have airflow going over your airfoil as such. Now the boundary layer is what it sounds like. It's a layer of air as it goes over the airfoil that acts as an adhesion point to the surface and the rest of the air itself. 
Okay, so really you have a microscopic layer of air that's acting as a boundary, the glue, if you will, to the rest of the air. And that's why as soon as it hit, it doesn't go burbling off. So you have that boundary layer. Now your boundary layer acts as a separate entity to the rest of the airflow that's going over it. So here's what happens. In a totally laminar airflow situation, and then I'll use a different color to act as a boundary layer. Your boundary layer is attached to your airfoil going in a direction of the airflow in relation to everything else. Your airflow, or the fluid, is actually attached to this boundary layer going with it. So this is the rest of your fluid. Now in a totally laminar situation, your separation point from your airfoil will be later meaning that your airflow is not going to break away from your airfoil until a later point. So your separation point might be, for example, right here. And that is illustrated on my illustration of the magnets ball, or the magnets effect, where you have your cylinder with your pressure. There's your static pressure right there. That stagnation point right there can be represented there. That is where your airflow separates from your airfoil. Now, if your airfoil is completely laminar, if the airflow is completely laminar, meaning that it's good airflow, what happens is that you're going to have separation late on your airfoil and you're going to have a very low coefficient of drag. That's very good. Coefficient of drag, as we all know, is the force or drag is a force that opposes thrust, and that's what slows you down. Now, when we change our angle of attack, meaning we change the angle at which the relative wind hits the airfoil, what happens is, is your airflow goes from laminar to turbulent, meaning that it breaks away from your airfoil earlier in the phase. So what's gonna happen is, is that as you increase your angle of attack, your relative wind, or excuse me, your boundary layer, will actually start flow, slowing down. It'll start slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. Correspondingly, your airflow over your airfoil will start to break away. And you'll start seeing something like that. So that's your transition from laminar to turbulent airflow. In a high angle of attack situation to where you start to lose lift, what will happen is your boundary layer will actually slow down and in reverse direction and start going the other way over your airfoil. Wait, when did that start? It starts. This starts to happen, and I'm just explaining it. What I can do is I'll draw it out. But your boundary layer is going, slows, stops, reverses direction. When that happens, the airflow going over your airfoil no longer has adhesion to the surface and then it breaks off. So then that would be your separation point right here, for example. Now if we were to basically draw this on a Magnus ball, essentially, what you'll see is you'll basically see that your area of static pressure correspondingly is increased However, the stagnation point is a lot closer to its point of origin. 
and then that's where you lose your lift. In essence though, that's what the boundary layer is. So all you really have to know is that the boundary layer is basically acts as an adhesion to the airflow going over your uh, airfoil. Now, okay, everybody got that? No. All right. So it acts as an adhesion for the airflow above it. Exactly, exactly, because the airflow itself Really, and as far as we're concerned, the airflow is all the same thing, basically. The airflow going over the airflow, because you're really only dealing with two different things. You're dealing with the surface itself, and you're dealing with the airflow. All I'm trying to say is that the boundary layer essentially acts as the adhesion. So you have the, you have the airfoil, you have the boundary layer itself, which is basically a microscopic pocket of air, a microscopic layer of air that's going over the airfoil and then you have the flu, the, uh, the rest of the air that's adhered to the boundary layer and that's what acts as an adhesion. The boundary layer will actually change its velocity based on the angle of attack of your airfoil. Mm -hmm. You can reach a critical angle of attack until what happens is your boundary layer speed basically will slow down, slow down, slow down, stop and then reverse direction and actually start going the opposite way. Where it comes to a stop is where your airflow will separate from your airfoil. And if you have that separation, then you're not producing lift. And if you're not producing lift, then basically you're not flying and you're falling out of the sky. Got that? I know it's deep, guys, but I promise you the test won't be this hard. All right, so everybody got it? Okay, so now what we got is let's go ahead and draw this out in terms that we can understand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some airfoils here at different angles of attack. And then I'm going to draw the airflow going over them and as far as how that works. So the first thing we have is we'll draw three airfoils here. We'll draw one at a zero angle of attack. We'll draw one at a two degree angle of attack and then we'll draw one at like let's say a four degree angle of attack. Okay. So as we already know your angle of attack is based on what? Your chord line that's opposite and parallel to your relative wind or the angle between your chord line and your relative wind. So when your relative wind is hitting it, your airflow is going to look a lot like this. So it's going to travel over and then you're going to have a breakaway point late in the airfoil, probably like right here. As you increase your angle of attack, what's going to happen is that it's going to go over. Breakaway points earlier. I'm sorry? Breakaway points earlier. Breakaway point is going to be right here. When your airflow is going to hit your airfoil and then go over and under. Now what's going to happen is, is that when it's a higher angle of attack, you'll have a point right there and it'll go underneath. Now your breakaway point will be earlier, like right here. So then you'll start seeing something like that. At your four degree angle of attack, It'll hit here, and then correspondingly, you'll see a later breakaway point. Okay. Now, the important thing here is that you're going to have increased static pressure in relation to your angle of attack. So you're going to be, you're going to have so much lift here. You're going to be developing more lift at two <coughs> degrees of angle of attack. You'll be developing more lift at four degrees of angle of attack and then so on and so forth until you hit the extreme example to where you hit on most airfoils at between 14 and 16 degrees. Once you get a 14 degree angle of attack or 16 degrees respectively, now I'm just doing 
drop here. You'll hit it, and then your stagnation point will be a lot later. At this point, this airfoil could still theoretically be producing lift. Until it finally goes enough, it breaks it away, and then what happens is you're not going to be producing any lift. There's not going to be any negative, there's not going to be any static pressure over your dynamic pressure. So what happens is, is that it breaks away, it breaks away, until you breach that critical angle of attack. That's why the flaps can be used. Right, exactly, and that's exactly what we're going to go into. We're going to go into flap usage. So then finally... For the record, it's 1.30. Okay, thanks. Man, time flies when you're having fun, right? Oh, yeah. And what happens is you're not going to have any... Basically, the right pressure there. on here is not going to be negative over this pressure. It's going to equalize, and then that's how you uh, basically lose lift. So... Basically, unless you're going straight up almost, you're going to be producing some kind of lift. Well, now don't forget, your angle of attack is based on your relative wind. And what's the definition of relative wind? Whichever way the wind is blowing, I guess. In relation to which is... Which way the plane is moving. Opposite and parallel your flight path. Okay. Okay, so your relative wind is opposite and parallel your flight path. So, you can be in a dive and be in a stalled out situation. You can be climbing and not be in a stalled out situation. Your angle of attack is going to be in relation to your uh, relative wind. So, uh, so you can be stalled in any attitude. So you need to think of a stalled condition in relation to your angle of attack in relation to its relative wind. So for example, let's say you have a jet fighter. I know, this is just my really amateur jet fighter drawing. Whoa. Okay. Right? And let's say he's just going straight up. I mean, he's just gunning for it, right? Well, if he has, theoretically, if he has enough power to overcome his weight, then his flight path will be, or his uh, flight path of the aircraft will be what? Straight up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, if he's straight up, where's the relative wind coming from? Opposite and parallel of his flight path. <laughs> so then, what would the angle of attack, angle of attack of his wings be at? Zero. Right. Well, zero or one or two or whatever the whatever is set up from from the factory. So would he be in a stalled condition? No. no. Okay. No. Now let's say we took the mighty 152 and we're like, hey, I can do that too, right? All right. So. Your flight path's like this. So we're in our little Cessna. We're in a little 152. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, initially our flight path is what direction? This way, right? Right. Okay. Well, we know we don't have enough power to point it straight up and power our way through it. So we're like, hey, I'm pretty, I'm pretty smart. I know what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive it down or get a little speed going on. Then I'm going to yank back on the control stick and get a good uh, nose up attitude going on. See if I, you know, give me a run and start. Well, what happens is, remember, your relative <coughs> wind is opposite and parallel with your flight path is. So your flight path, when you're beginning this maneuver, is going to be this way. So your relative wind is going to be in this direction, right here. Now, what happens is, when you gun it straight up, and then I'll go ahead and draw a picture. So here you are, you're gunning it straight up. So there you go, you're giving it all she got. Right? It's creaking and everything. And I'm going to use a different color for that relative wind. Okay? Well, one thing we do know for sure is that your flight trajectory isn't going to be straight up. It's probably going to be at an angle. Because what you're doing is you're going here, and then you're yanking her back, so your momentum's probably carrying you right something like this, okay? Well, if this is your flight path, then your relative wind is opposite and parallel to your flight path. So then what's your angle of attack in comparison to your core line? 
if you're in a position like this. If it's coming like this and your cord line is straight up, now your cord line is what? The imaginary line from your wing tip or from your leading edge to your trailing edge, right? So that's our angle of attack right there. Angle of attack. So then, yeah, you can be in a stalled out position, okay? Likewise, you can be stalled out in a dive. Let's say, and this used to happen to a lot of guys, what happens is they're in their little jet fighter or whatever. Basically, they're diving. Okay, so there's our jet. Again, delta wing and all. So it's making a dive for it, right? I know. Just, just work with me here, guys. These are imagination. Plug, oh, plug okay. in the gaps with your right, imagination. I see it. All right. So, so you jet fighter, right? So he's in a dive. So his flight path is this way, right? But then what does he see? Oh my God! Who put that flipping mountain there, right? Or that tree or whatever? So he's like, okay, well, I'm not going to make that. So I'm going to pull back with everything I got and try to pull out that dive. So in his mind, what he's trying to do is he's trying to do something like this. All right, pull out of the dive and clear that mountain. The problem is, is that his flight path, these two vectors are resulting of these two vectors. is probably something like this. All right. And his angle of attack is based on the relative wind to his flight path. So what happens is his nose, when he gets here, his nose may be pointed this way. His nose may look like it's going to clear the mountain, but his flight path is still taking him into the mountain. So, it, so he's going to be in a position like this. For all intents and purposes, it looks like he's going to clear that mountain. Well, what happened was downward momentum, his flight path, if you will, is taking him downward. His relative wind is opposite and parallel to his flight path. That's what takes his angle of attack. So he can have an extreme angle of attack, have a relatively nose low attitude, and still be in a stalled condition. Hmm. So, that's what, so that's what I want to press on you. Your angle of attack is based on your relative wind. You can be in a stalled condition at any attitude. Okay, so you can be in a stall condition pointed straight up, you can be in a stall condition pointed straight down, you can be in a stall condition in a turn. Okay, it's a function of your core line relative to your, uh, to your relative wind. That's your angle of attack. Okay, now let's talk about high lift devices. Now you take your airflow right here. Now we all said your angle of attack was a function of what, right? It's a function of your core line in relation to your relative wind. So if you take an airfoil, what's the best way you can change its lift characteristics? You're shaping it. Okay, and your shape exactly does what? Well, it controls the speed of the air going under the pressure, uh, low pressure, high pressure zones. It can manipulate where they are. It, 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 it can do that. Some of, some of them, like if your slots and slats do that, they manipulate the pressure changes around the airfoil, energize the boundary layer, if you will. But in this case, the best thing we can do is change the core line, change the angle of the core line. So that's what flaps do. So let's say we throw a flap on this and we give it a flap down situation. So we drop the flaps right here, right? Okay. So we put the flap on it. Well, what's the definition of a cord line? From the, from the leading edge to the trailing edge, right? 
So then what happens if we draw a line now from our leading edge to our curling edge? It's going to change. It's going to change. Oh, oh, because now the bottom is down. Exactly. Then let me see if I can draw that. Okay. All right. So your chord line is going to change, and I know that's not the best drawing, but you know, I do it what I can with what I got. Okay. So, so what does this mean? Right here. The the uh, airflow going over it's going to be like change like extremely. Well, yeah, it is going to be affected, but primarily, okay. Who everybody's been flying already, right? Okay, what happens when you're coming in for a landing and you drop in your first 10 degrees of flaps? What does the nose, ha what does the nose have a tendency to do? Pitch up. Yeah, exactly. It has a tendency to pitch up. So what do we tell you? We tell you, okay, get ready to hold the nose down because your nose is about to pitch up. Now the reason is, is because when you're in a straight and level flight and you drop the flap, what happens is, and then let me go ahead and see if I can, uh, well, if you drop the flap, and this is actually at a straight level. So if you drop the flap, your chord line is going to change. So your chord line between your relative wind and your chord line versus what your new chord line is just changed. So this is your chord line before the flaps. This is your chord line after the flaps. Your angle of attack just increased just by dropping that flap. And when the angle of attack increases, then what's going to happen? You're going to generate more lift, right? And if you generate more lift, what's that nose going to want to do? It's going to raise on you. Right, so then you've got to hold it forward. Now remember what I had talked about here. You may remember when I drew a graph for you. Okay? Now this graph right here, you have your angle of attack down here. And then you have your CL right here, your coefficient of lift. And your angle of attack is measured in degrees. So it's 2, 4, 6, 8, so on and so forth, with your coefficient of lift being measured in 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.2, so on and so forth. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a corresponding increase in lift with a corresponding increase in your angle of attack. Okay? So you increase your angle of attack, you're going to increase your lift. That's why you get that nose up tendency. So primarily, your, the function of your flap is to both increase lift, increase drag, and change your chord line in relation to your relative wind. I better write that down, actually. Increase lift, increase drag, and then uh, change chord line. Okay. So now you have different types of flaps for different functions. What does that say, change flaps? Oh, sorry, saying change chord line in relation to relative wind. Alright. Everybody good? No. No. So, if, uh, I'm just assuming this but uh, not small. Is that why we put the flaps down? I'm pretty sure we put the flaps down. Or do we put the flaps down? No, you put full power in and pitch down. Now you're talking about when you're landing? Or, or just like in a stall or going down? Or oh, yes. Okay. So when you stall out, the, the recovery for a stall is you want to full power and you want to pitch down because all you got to do then is uh, resume airflow over the, air, over the wings. And then once you resume airflow over the wings, then you'll start developing lift again. And then uh, that's how you recover. 
So you always want to increase power um, and then drop the nose. Well, we'll talk about stalls in a little bit. I'm just want to get the basics of why a wing works first before we start talking about how to recover from adverse situations. Okay. All right. Last thing to do before, because I got a feeling that bell's about to ring. Yeah. 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 Wow. Two fifty-three. Man, time flies. Man, you can't teach nothing in fifty minutes. I hate to see your other classes. By the time you just get done using the bathroom, drinking water, and saying, "Hey, what's going on?" Talk Ooh. about the weather. Barely got time to learn. Okay. Huh? It's only a fun class. It's only a fun class that are short. Yeah, that's usually how it works out. Yeah, this, right. this class definitely feels like the shortest of the day by far. Well, because I keep y'all thinking. I keep y'all busy. Okay, so your flaps, right? Mm -hmm. And I probably didn't give myself enough room here. So I'll probably go ahead and review this again tomorrow. But your four different flaps is you got a plain flap. And all your plain flap does is that's a simple flap that swings down on a hinge. So in this case, this would be your airfoil you know, that, you know, basically with no flaps, and then you'd have a simple, basically a drop like that. And then, so this is, just imagine this turning into that, basically. So that drops. So you have a, that's known as a plane flap. So write that down, plane flap. So you got a plane flap. You got a Fowler flap. Now your Fowler flap actually extends and then drops down on a little motorized track. So your Fowler flap, whereas with your plain flap, it just drops, your Fowler flap will actually extend out and then drop. Okay? So not only does this change the cord line of your wing, it also changes the surface area, which gives you more lift because your lift is directly correlated to how much surface area you have. So your Fowler flap is generally a better flap than your plain flap, but it's uh, motorized, so the repair costs are a lot more. Then what you have is you have a split flap, which is different from a plain flap, because a split flap is hinged right here. And then what it's going to do is it's going to drop down like this. Okay? So unlike a plain flat, it's going to keep the top area as well as the top area of the airfoil as well as the bottom area of the airfoil. And then finally, you have what's known as a split flap. Now a split flap... Didn't we just do a split flap? Yeah. Hmm? Didn't we just do a split flap? The, 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 the flap we just did... I'm sorry, the um, slotted flap. My bad, excuse me. Now your slotted flap is basically going to be like this, but the primary function is when it extends down, hang on, let me just, when it extends down, it's going to create a slot of air. Man, I am just like messing this drawing up. Okay, draw this after I get done drawing it. Okay, there we go. Now the whole purpose of this is that it extends the surface area. It works kind of like a Fowler flap. It's gonna retract out, it's gonna retract down, it's gonna extend the surface area of the wing, but then what it's gonna do is it's gonna redirect airflow from the bottom over to the top. Yes, indeed. What manner of sorcery is that? And the whole point of that is that it's trying to energize the boundary layer to where to delay separation. And what is that one called? This is the slotted flap. So this is split, and then here's slotted.
I need to work on my airflow drawings. I need to work on my airflow drawings. Okay. 